Next, ladies and gentlemen, we have yet another legend, uh, Guy Kawasaki, who is the chief evangelist of Canva. Now, he's a living legend, if I may say so, and he's an author and a startup advisor. He was one of the main people who evangelized the original Apple Macintosh and is currently the chief evangelist of Canva, like I said. It's an online graphic design service and the creator of the remarkable People podcast. There's more about him that I'd like to uh, let you guys know. He's written multiple books. He has a, he's written Wise Guy. He's written The Art of the Start 2.0, uh, The Art of Social Media, Enchantment, and 11 other books. So Kawasaki has a BA from Stanford University and um, an MBA from UCLA and an honorary doctorate from Babson College. So that's a lot. But uh, after uh, Jahan's talk, I'm so excited to hear each of these speakers. And this gentleman is truly a legend. So without any further delay, uh, Guy Kawasaki, take it away. Hi, I'm Guy Kawasaki. I'm in Santa Cruz, California right now, but I'm happy and proud to be part of O21 Disrupt. I'm going to talk to you today about the art of starting a company that dents the universe. So hi, my name is Guy Kawasaki. I am the chief evangelist of Canva and the creator of the Remarkable People podcast. But my greatest claim to fame is that I am Samir's friend and I use social champ every day. I'm going to talk to you about the art of the start 2.0, not 1.0, 2.0. And I'm going to explain to you the 10 key principles of entrepreneurship. Okay, here we go. Principle number one is ask simple questions. Lots of people think that the genesis of great tech companies is because there was this megalomaniac planning to conquer the world and you know do all this kind of great stuff. But my observation is typically a great company starts with a very simple question, such as, therefore what? Therefore what means you have a vision, you have an insight, you have a guess, you're lucky, and you see that something is going to change. Pandemic is going to cause online education. People are going to have phones that can share pictures. So you create an online education site, or you create Instagram to share pictures. Because you saw something, you asked the question, therefore what? That's one kind of question. Next kind of question is, isn't this interesting? So you do something, and maybe you don't get the intended result, but isn't this interesting that you tried to create this kind of chemical or, or this kind of device, and lo and behold, it does something else, does something better, people love it? Isn't that interesting? Go with the flow. Third question is, is there a better way? Two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in a garage. And they're asking themselves, surely there must be a better way to do computing than minis and mainframes. Therefore, we start Apple. Isn't there a better way? Those are the kinds of questions that generate great startups. The second thing is to make what I call the MVVVP. Now, most people are familiar with the MVP, which is the minimum viable product. I would like to add two more Vs, that this product should also be valuable. It should be important. It dents the universe. And also, it should validate your vision. It should validate what you're seeing, what you know, know in quotes, is going to happen. So instead of just making a minimal viable product, I want you to make a minimal viable, valuable and validating product. Third thing is to get going. Now, I think many entrepreneurs fail because they're trying to wait for the perfect product, the perfect market, the perfect team, the perfect everything. That's not how it works. It's a very messy business. So looking back, you should look at version one of your product and cringe like, Oh my God, you know, what were we thinking? How did we ship that piece of crap? That's okay. You need to jump to the next curve. You need to create something that's innovative and valuable and validating and also viable, but it doesn't have to be perfect. So 
get going. It's okay to do something cringeworthy. Find some complimentary soulmates. That is, to get going, you need to find people who do what you cannot do. And you should do what they cannot do. So if you're the engineer, you need salespeople. If you're the salesperson, you need engineers. Salesperson without engineers has nothing to sell. Engineers without salespeople cannot sell anything. Find complimentary soulmates. Third thing is to make a mantra. Two or three words that describe why you exist. My personal mantra is empower people. Two words. Canva, democratize design. It's two or three words that describe why you exist. So get going. Step number three, excuse me, step number four. Step number four is to define a business model because many entrepreneurs, they sort of wave their hands and they say, well, you know, Uber didn't have a business model and, and Airbnb didn't have a business model and Instagram didn't have a business model and Facebook didn't have a business model. So we don't need a business model. That's not true. Don't confuse luck <laughs> with skill. So you need to come up with a business model. So let's talk about the qualities of a business model. First of all, be specific. Exactly who is your customer? A good way to look at it is who has your money in their pocket? And the business model is about extracting the money from their pocket and putting it into your pocket. Next thing, keep it simple. Keep your business model simple. If you're trying to create a patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting product, and you're also trying to create a curve jumping, paradigm shifting, patent pending, innovative, revolutionary business model, it's too hard. It's hard enough to create a great product. Creating a great product and a great new business model is too hard. Keep it simple. And the third thing is, I think when you come up with an idea, you should ask women what they think of the idea. Because generally speaking, women are much better judges about the viability of a new business. Trust me when I tell you that. Women are better judges of entrepreneurial ideas. The fifth step is to weave a mat. You know, when you start a company, you think, oh my God, you know, there's so many fun things to do. We can design our logo. We can figure out our domain. We can order stationery. We can do all that, can buy new furniture, all that kind of stuff. But you know what? That stuff is not as important. And I want to focus you on what to do. So first thing is figure out what your milestones are. And milestones are major things. Milestones are things you would call up your parents and say, today we finished the design. Today we shipped. Today we sold and collected our first revenue. A stands for assumptions. What are the assumptions in our model? What are the assumptions in my company? You know, how many sales calls can we make? How many people are going to be converted from free to paid? You need to test those kinds of assumptions. That's the next step. So to do that, you need to launch a site. You need to get out in the marketplace. You can't just be thinking about it and hypothesizing how people will embrace your product. And the final T is tasks. So finally, when you figure out these milestones and the assumptions that you're going to test and the tests you're going to use to test those assumptions, then you need to start doing tasks. These are really tactical things like hire an engineer. So milestones, assumption, tests, and tasks. We have a mat. Number six is you know you have to be able to tell your story. Key points about telling your story. First, make it personal. Why did you create this company? Was it because you wanted the product? Was it because your spouse wanted the product? Was it because someone you loved or cared for had this great need and you wanted to fill that need? Make it personal. It's not about you know, fifth paradigms of personal computing. It's not about IoT. Make it personal. Why do you, why do people you know and love want this? Second quality is to use the 10, 20, 30 rule in telling a story. The 10, 20, 30 rule is that there should be 10 slides in your pitch. You should be able to give those 10 slides in 20 minutes and no font should be smaller than 30 points. The last thing is to apply the opposite rule, which is to present pretend, excuse me, which is to pretend that whenever you say something, you think, ah, 
am I saying something that's opposite or at least very different from what every entrepreneur says? So if you stand up and you say, I have patent pending, curve jumping, paradigm shifting, scalable, bug free product. And then the next person says that and the next person says that none of you have said anything. So apply the opposite test. Are you saying something different? Are you saying something opposite? And I lied. Here's a fourth tip. Ask, so what? Pretend that there's a little person sitting on your shoulder. And every time you tell some aspect of your story, that person says to you, so what, guy? If I tell you that Canva is cloud-based, the little person says, guy, so what? Well, if it's cloud-based, it means you can be on any platform. That's the so what. So make it personal, use the 10, 20, 30 rule, apply the opposite rule, and ask, so what? Number seven, hire passionate people, people who love what you do. Some tips. First of all, ignore the irrelevant. A perfect background without feelings of passion, ignore that. Ignore that person. The lack of a perfect background but does feel passionate, ignore the lack of a perfect background. Ignore the irrelevant. Number two, hire better than yourself. A players hire A plus players. They at least hire A players. They don't hire B players because B players hire C players and C player hire D players. And finally, apply the shopping center test. You go to a shopping center, you see someone that you are thinking of hiring, do you rush over to that person and say hello? Or do you say, oh, if I actually get face to face, I'll say hello? Or do you go to another place to shop? Your reaction should be, I'm going to go straight over there and say hello. Number eight. Number eight is that to start a company today, you have to grok social media. You need to socialize. This means you, you perfect your profiles on all the platforms with the right avatar and the right cover photo. But you get all that stuff right. You pay attention to that because people are making judgments about you and your company from your profiles. Then I would suggest in social media, you embrace what I call the Wikipedia model. And the Wikipedia model is this. Wikipedia raises about $90 million every year. And why do they do that? How do they do that? They run these god-awful ads in it. And you think about it, you know, what other service can run those kinds of ads and raise a hundred million bucks or so, right? And why is that true? It's because Wikipedia pro provides value. So if you provide value through your social media posts, not just promoting what you do, but actually providing value, then you will earn the right to promote what you do. That's the Wikipedia model. And finally, Try to pass the reshare test. The reshare test is what you post to social media is so good that not only do your followers like it, they like it so much that they reshare it to their followers. And that's how you build up a greater following. Number nine. Number nine is about seeding the clouds. This is a saying in America about making it rain. Making it rain means sales, revenue, sales fixes everything. So let a hundred flowers blossom. You may think you have a spreadsheet database and wood processing computer. Come to find out the market says you have a desktop publishing machine. Take the money. Macintosh, desktop publishing. We thought we were, <laughs> seriously, I, it brings laughter to me right now, even there, 30 years later. We thought we had a spreadsheet database and wood processing machine. Oops, zero for three. The market told us we had a desktop publishing machine. The market tells you one thing, take it and run with it. Take the money. Number two, to make it rain, enable test drives. Enable people to try your product or service and then decide. And the last thing is to find the influencers. Now, you know, this is kind of a duhism. Of course, you're going to find the influencers, guy, as opposed to the people who aren't influencers. Well, duh, of course, you're going to find the influencers. But consider who the influencers are. It may not be the people with the titles. It may be the secretary, administrative aide, management trainee, intern. Those are the people who do the real work. They may influence the decision, even though they don't have the title. Number 10. Number 10 is do not let the clowns grind you down. These clowns, these naysayers, these bozos, they're going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. 
So I'm going to show you some examples of how very famous people were very wrong to show you that just because someone smart or rich or famous tells you you'll fail, it doesn't mean you will fail. And I would make the case that if you listen to those people because they're rich and famous, though not necessarily smart, you may never try. And that may be the worst outcome of all. So I need to show you examples in history where if people had believed these successful people, they would have never tried. And the world would not have a lot of great companies. I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Chairman of IBM, five computers. I have five Macintoshes in my house. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union wrote off telephony in 1876. Oops. There's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, fantastic entrepreneur, fantastic innovator in the mini computer business. He could not embrace the personal computer business. Don't let these people grind you down. Now, I wish I could tell you when somebody says you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. That's not true either. But if somebody tells you you'll fail and you never try and you never know, arguably, that's the worst outcome of all. So that's the art of the start. And now, I think there's some questions that people wanted me to answer. So here we go. Question number one, what should first-time angel investors look for in a startup or look at in a startup before investing? I think that, well, the classic answer to this is there are three components, team, market, and technology. And basically, everybody says you look at the team, right? Because you're such a great judge of character, such a great judge of entrepreneurial skill that you're going to pick this team and because you're such a good judge of intellectual ability and character and all that good stuff, you're going to pick a team and they may not have the right market. They might not have the right product, but they're going to pivot and be successful. I think that's a total BS theory. I think that the way you do this is you look for two guys in a garage, two gals in a garage, a guy and a gal in the garage, and they are building the product that they want to use. They are probably an unproven team. Think of Apple, Waz, and Steve. Do you think they were proven in an unproven market? Personal computers in 1976, there was no such thing. Unproven technology. It's not like Waz had built up a mini computer or mainframe business before. So Apple, unproven team, unproven market. Unproven technology, there's zero for three, and Apple is the most valuable company in the world. So I'm not saying everybody's going to be an Apple, but I, I think that you should look for these two people building something they want to use, and your intuition has to tell you that, huh, you know, maybe people do want a personal computer. Maybe they do want a social media platform. Maybe they do want a way to build graphics online without having to buy Photoshop. That's the richest vein. Next question. What are the qualities startup founders should look for in angel investors or VCs? Well, cutting to the chase, <laughs> when all is said and done, you're looking for people who will write a check. And now I understand the concept that you know, you want value-added investors and people who have time and they have bandwidth and they have expertise and they have connections and all that good stuff, okay? So, yeah, you're supposed to look for value-added investors. But can I tell you something? At the end of the day, all money is green. Well, in America, our money is green. I don't know what color the money is in Pakistan, but, you know, you get what I'm saying. So, yeah. Yeah, listen, in a perfect world, you'd want a VC who has time, has the interest, has the expertise, all that good stuff, okay? Has the connections, all that good stuff. But, man, if somebody gets it and wants to write a check to you, and it's not, it's a professional investor, it's not a dentist who's thinking that he or she is funding the next Google and will want to know in six months why you haven't gone public, take the money. Just take the money. 
What impact are evangelists able to make in the journey of a tech startup? For example, in your role at Apple and Canva. So evangelism comes from a Greek word meaning bringing the good news. So an evangelist brings the good news. I brought the good news of Macintosh, how it made people more creative and productive. I am bringing the good news of Canva, how it has democratized design. So what an evangelist does is sell your dream. It convinces people to believe in what you do as much as you do. And that's how evangelists impact any company. They get people to believe. The key to evangelism is called Guy's Golden Touch. And Guy's Golden Touch is not that whatever I touch turns to gold. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold, Guy touches. This is me telling you that the key to evangelism is to create something great because it is easy to evangelize something great. It is hard to evangelize crap. What are the key strengths a startup from Pakistan needs to have in order to become the first class or successful, I take it? Well, you know what? Prior to the pandemic, I would have said that investors like to deal with companies that are, I don't know, within an hour or two geographically from where they are. So that's why Silicon Valley had a big advantage because you know if your offices are in Menlo Park, and you're down in LA, that's kind of okay. That's an hour flight. But you know, once you get beyond that, and all of a sudden you have to fly to New York or fly to Pakistan or fly to Sydney, Australia, or Canva is, you know, that's a problem. So pre-pandemic, you know, for distance was an issue because of time zone changes and board meetings and travel and all that kind of stuff. But now, with the pandemic, you know, whether you are located in Menlo Park, a mile from the venture capitalists, or in Pakistan, you're just a little box in a Zoom app, or a Teams app, or a Skype app. So all those little boxes, all those virtual people, it doesn't matter where they are. So, you know... I would say that the pandemic, for all its tragedy and pain and suffering, one of the positive things is I think it's going to make the world flatter, that people will stop caring or at least care less about where you are geographically. So the answer to this question is create something great. <laughs> Duh, create something great. What is the type of organizations that don't really benefit from the use of social media? My, <laughs> I, off the top of my head, I you know I can't imagine that there is many kinds of companies that cannot benefit from social media. I mean, social media is the greatest gift ever to entrepreneurs because it makes marketing so much cheaper and effective if you do it right. But it certainly it does not require money to be successful in social media. It requires well, it requires luck. It requires insight. It requires hard work, but not necessarily money. If all it took was money, <laughs> more large brands would be successful in social media. Okay, so social media is a great leveler. Um, it's the best thing that ever happened to entrepreneurs. Okay, I think those are the questions. And so I would just like to remind you to please check out my podcast. It's called Remarkable People. And if I had done this right, I would have had the remarkable people slide here. But just to show you that I really can operate on the fly twice in this presentation, I am going to create one more slide, and I'm going to take away this text box. You are seeing Kai Kawasaki create slides on the fly. And I am going to put in a picture from a file from my remarkable people. Okay, so now let us go back to current slides. So now, now. You could make the case. Well, first of all, 
I'm just a perfectionist. I cannot handle the fact that you could not see the border on the bottom. Okay, so now we go back here. Okay, changing on the fly once more. So I just want to remind you, please go check out my podcast. It's at remarkablepeople.com, and it has a bunch of people that any entrepreneur should listen to. It has Jane Goodall, who you see in this picture. It has Martha Stewart, Ariana Huffington, David Ocker, who's the father of branding, Bob Cialdini, who's the father of influence. It has Steve Wozniak, Steve Wolfram, physicist, MacArthur Award winner, Gary Vaynerchuk, Scott Galloway, marketing professor. Uh, let's see. Christy Yamaguchi, figure skater. So it has all these people who are truly remarkable. And I promise you, listening to every podcast, you will be a little bit more remarkable and it will help you on your entrepreneurial path. Okay? So this is Guy Kawasaki. It's been a pleasure to be here. Please check out my podcast. Remember my lessons from the art of the start. Get out there and make your M V V V P and dent the universe. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 oh